welcome everyone to uh, Learning Beyond the Classroom, uh, the experiential learning evolution. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted uh, to be with you all today. My name is Michael Horn. I'm the uh, a principal consultant at Entangled Solutions and Innovation Services firm in the education space. And joined here uh, by three panel members. We're hopeful that the fourth will show up. But um, we've got uh, Ken Montgomery to my uh, immediate right here uh, from VTech <coughs> School. We're going to move over, Brian? Yeah. OK, are you going to be Christine? Um, yeah, I'll just be Christine. And uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, the founder and executive director at DTEC um, in, in, uh, in, in the Bay Area. Uh, we've got Imran, uh, the CEO of Embark uh, in Chicago. Uh, and then, of course, Brian McAllister, the co-founder co of Road Trip Nation. Uh, so excited to talk about this uh, uh, conversation. What I, what I hope will unfold over the next uh, uh, 49 minutes um, is a conversation that we really get to benefit about uh, what is experiential learning, its future, its impact, uh, and what are the tensions with schooling as it exists now, and I'm, I'm hopeful that they'll mix it up and explore, and I'll fade into the background. One logistical note, because I know often when a panel ends, uh, people love to talk to the panelists. There's a panel right after here at 11 o'clock, and so if people can just fade to the back and have conversations there so there can be a smooth transition, that would be great. Uh, but with that, we'll get started. And, and what I'd love to kick it off with is just a, a question for each of you, which um, hopefully will be a short answer, but maybe a longer one, which is just how do you define experiential learning? What is it and what isn't it? Uh, so I'll take a crack at it. Um, from our experience at Road Trip Nation, I, I would say it's, a, uh, it's an interest-based approach to where you are integrating a student's interest that are potentially outside the classroom to what they're actually learning and applying inside the classroom. And so, um, and then creating a unique interaction. And you, we use the word authenticity a lot with Road Trip. I could actually break that down to just being individual, like just individualized and, um, and facilitating or designing an experience that's, that, apply, that aligns what you're learning in the classroom to, to an outside experience. Um, I think the University of Chicago uh, did a phenomenal study on this, um, and uh, it's called the Young Adult Framework for Success, and uh, I think they define experiential learning, uh, and they think about it as a developmental experience, and uh, a lot of that is very aligned to the way Embark thinks about experiential learning, so it basically means that you're learning in the real world, hands-on, touching, feeling, uh, and you're doing a type of experience that moves through a sequence, right? It begins with encountering a new idea, uh, and you sort of move through tinkering with those ideas uh, or those experiences, and you make choices, you do presentations um, about your learning, and you're able to reflect. So it's really a, it's a, a cycle of action and reflection. So I, I want to distinguish, in a way, the difference between a field trip and an experiential learning uh, journey or a developmental experience. Uh, the difference is like when we think about field trips, oftentimes we think about two people holding, uh, a bunch of kids holding hands, they go to the museum, they walk around and they, they get done and that's like uh, a field trip. An experiential, uh, a developmental experience or experiential learning will uh, have a lot more pieces in place, right? You'll, uh, students will have a leadership role There'll be a lot of analysis that's taking place. There's a lot of action and there's reflection in, in real time. There's stuff done beforehand, there's stuff that's done during, and there's stuff that's done afterwards. Uh, all to make the experience a highly reflective uh, uh, experience that they can learn a, a lot uh, from. I think the reflection part, the action and the reflection part, is one of the most important elements <laughs> in, in experiential learning. Right, and I, I would echo that, that uh, for us, we go back to to Dewey, you said one of the best ways for education to occur is for students to have a meaningful experience and then reflect on it. And for us, we really emphasize the, the meaningful part of it, that writing a literary analysis essay I mean, can teach some valuable skills, but is it meaningful to the student? Not so much, but if they're writing, if they're creating an online STEAM magazine that they think they know, that they're trying to get a lot of views for and really publish meaningful content, then that is something that is meaningful for the student. And so for us, it really is, they have to have the experience, but again, I mean, echoing what you said, that it's not, um, not just any experience, it has to be a meaningful experience, and then the reflection on it, that's when the education really takes place. Is meaning always defined by the interest of the student? Or, 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 or like, how do you negotiate um, uh, exposure of opportunity to students to, to put them in experiences that may be uncomfortable sometimes? 
versus something that's really passion interest driven? Yeah, uh, I'll take a crack at that. And so uh, one of the biggest issues that we face in Chicago, and I think m many people face across the country, is a lack of exposure and isolation. And so in that, in that essence, oftentimes students will have a certain idea about what they like and they don't like, but um, it's an educator's experience to often make uh, students go through uncomfortable situations mm. in new places uh, and to discover who they really are and, and what they really care mm. about. And so a big part of what we do in Embark is to ensure that students have a wide range of different experiences and uh, uh, collaborative experiences, uh, service learning experiences, uh, um, arts and culture, as well as business and university experiences, all in unique ways. And that way they can have a wide range of these experiences so that they can have a better understanding mm -hmm. of the kind of pathways and the kind of models of success that there are. You all agree with that? Well, I would say that it's, I mean, that is I mean, one of the hazards in experiential learning if you just, if you define meaning solely based on student interest. Because a lot of times, um, student interest, they might be interested in things that, that we know as adults and mentors and teachers that you know that's not necessarily going to take them down the best path mm -hmm. educationally so i think interest has a key part of it mm -hmm. and what we do at um at design tech we have we have very flexible schedules and so we partner a lot with um, industry experts and professionals for for example if um, a student that wants to learn computer coding we have employees from oracle that will volunteer and teach mm -hmm. them how to how to solve problems in computer coding where it's, um, and they can explain things in a, a more meaningful way to the students because that, that computer coder was just, he was working on the problem, he or she was working on the problem, and he goes and talks to one of our students, and then she says, oh, I understand, you know, how this applies in the real world. But that is not something that initially, especially if we're trying to get mm -hmm. um, underrepresented groups into mm -hmm. the tech field in our case, that is not something that a student might raise their hand and, you know, she may not say, like, well, I'm interested in that. So you do have to, to nudge, and mm -hmm. I think that a lot of times, mm -hmm. if you're just chasing after the, what are students interested, let's give them that experience, that um, you might sacrifice things educationally. Yeah, I mean, I, I will have it. You sometimes, obviously, you need to create hooks. So you need to create hooks that get students interested in wanting to go out and experience. And sometimes you use their interest for those kind of things, just things that are a little safer. Say, for example, um, you know, you, you'll take students to, uh, an arts and culture experience that most people will probably feel pretty comfortable about and then at other times you really push the envelope like make us different schools pair together to go on amazing race challenges in city of Chicago um, very difficult things mm -hmm. uh, so you can pair those those up I, I would add you know it's interesting that you bring that up because uh, you know it's how you design that and how do you apply it? You know, one thing that we look back on from Road Trip Nation is that we had, you know, so, so many of you that don't know Road Trip Nation, you know, we're one part a media company, we're one part education company, but it started out of this, this, this almost a frustration that a lot of the tools and resources that we were, that we were kind of provided within our academic experience just weren't fulfilling. We just didn't identify with a lot of the career paths that we knew about, and so it goes back to exposure. But I think when you go back to the student's interests, you can almost talk about like student agency. And, and there is a strong, you know, as you facilitate an experiential, you know, the application back to academics to us is a little bit of the magic recipe. It's not just to be kind of like unrealistic and kind of say, follow your interests. It's a lot of students just don't know that if they love to draw, that there's probably 25 different pathways out there that, that integrate this passion for drawing and a career and, and, and a thriving employment opportunity. And that to us at Road Trip is this, is this alignment between what you like to do, what your interests are, and then a, a, a possible pathway out there. And so then we go back to exposure. Well, the other area that we've really seen a lot of uh, valuation done is self-efficacy and relevancy. You know, when a student believes that there is a possible pathway for their future with an interest of drawing, we've seen that uh, GPA in, uh, scores uh, have increased over an academic year. Just with this idea that a student has an increase of non-cognitive skill development or self-efficacy that they believe that there's, you know, there's a goal in mind. And even though they, at, especially in the K-12, they are far from hitting that, but they have been exposed to that and they have been inspired and they've been able to, at Road Trip Nation, we've been able to, to a certain degree, humanize some of these endpoints that are just so important in a lot of the areas that we work with within our curriculum. That may be a great segue into, uh, if, if each of you could just uh, uh, describe your, your programs and, and, and where the experiential learning comes in and how you design that. Um, 
and, and, and both the media side and the education, sure. uh, I, 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 probably, you're cracking a smile probably about uh, the tension of describing all that, but I think it'd be great just for folks uh, to get a sense in each of your environments, you know, school, programs outside of school, connection to school, what does that look like? Um, so uh, I'll tell a quick story. Uh, about nine years ago, I began teaching at Harper High School in the south side of Chicago. Um, it's uh, a very notorious area in the city, uh, known for gangs, drugs, and violence, and all that. In fact, uh, This American Life did a two-part series on mm -hmm. that school. Anybody uh, hear that? Um, yes, it documented the fact, it turned out to be their most downloaded uh, listened to because it documented the fact that uh, 29 kids were shot, eight were killed in a single school, single year. So it really captured, here we are in one of the, one of the toughest schools in the country. And what we discovered there while I was teaching, the, one of the biggest elements that came as, as a surprise is that as we are looking at education and we're looking at all these interventions to change outcomes for students, one of the biggest elements that we fail to recognize that really moves us to become who we are is the experiences we have, the places we've been, the things we've seen, the people we've been around. And we saw that the isolation that many of our students were facing, the fact that some of them had never seen the lake uh, with their own eyes, even though it was three miles away, was one of the greatest factors that was diminishing their outcomes in education. So, uh, it was a simple one-to-one, -one, right? You see a bunch of students who don't understand, uh, they have aspirations, but not exactly understanding the pathways and the actions they need to take every day to achieve those things. And then you say, all right, let's start by um, taking our students on some field trips uh, and showing them the world. So I began to do that, and immediately we saw a huge return on investments, grades, attendance, test scores started to skyrocket, aspirations, um, and that was the beginning of the Embark program. And so we took that idea, me and another teacher from Harper, and um, now it's in 18 schools in the city of Chicago. Uh, we're a three-year program, and we provide students uh, intensive experiences in businesses and arts and culture and universities. Uh, we're turning the city into a giant classroom for kids, and um, each year they have about 10 to 12 experiences all around the city from sophomore, junior, senior year, and then we support them as they use those experiences into their post-secondary uh, career pathways and their, and their uh, aspirations. So that's basically what Embark has become as this uh, experiential architects and creating all of these experiences. So when we think about what makes a really good experience, um, we think about uh, it being mindset shifting, for one, um, and that means a lot uh, that Brian was just talking about. Um, relevancy, self-efficacy, um, belonging, um, and uh, using those positive mindsets, making sure that your experience is able to hit all of those elements and that you have to ask yourself, uh, if they go to the park, when they go to the park, will it affect their ideas of relevancy self-efficacy, their, their sense of belonging. Um, and if it can do some of those things, uh, then you could turn even a trip to the park, as simple as that, into something transformational. Um, and then on the, other, on the other end, we think about certain pillars about our experiences, like what's the adult to student ratio? The higher the adult to student ratio, the higher the interactions between so many people, you can start seeing really interesting effects as students get the one-to-one -one attention or the higher attention. We also think about uh, how you shift the power dynamics. So when students go on experiences and they're out in the real world, are they just receiving or are they sharing and telling and learning and teaching? right at the same time. So we, we think about some of those elements as we, as we create those experiences uh, in the city of Chicago. Oh, come um, on. <laughs> so uh, I would say that some of the most uh, impressive stuff is that even though in, the, in Chicago public schools, uh, many people might consider our work social emotional learning or non-cognitive work, um, but one of the reasons we've had so much success is that our data is showing dramatic advancements in academics. So um, we take 2.0 students uh, who have a 70% likelihood of graduating high school no matter what school they go to, and we are in some of the toughest schools in the city, and we have a 97% high school graduation rate. We also have a 93% college enrollment rate, and that is uh, skyrockets over uh, the average of the Chicago public schools, and we're in some of the toughest uh, places taking the middle-tier students.
that's helpful. Let, let me just quickly uh, introduce uh, uh, Christine joining us, v uh, VP of uh, the Museum of Science in, in, in Boston, um, and uh, I guess the founder of the Engineering uh, uh, is Elementary um, program. So um, what we're doing right now, just heard from Imran, is uh, just describing the program um, uh, itself. So Ken, you want to jump in? Yes, so we're a, a charter high school in the Bay Area in Silicon Valley. Um, so we'll serve grades 9 through 12. And for us, I mean, our, our mission is to develop students to believe that the world can be a better place and that they can be the ones to make it happen. Because I think if you live in the Silicon Valley, you have to say that your mission is to make the world a better place. But we honestly, like, we honestly believe it. We honestly pull that apart that we want our students to develop this sense of optimism that the world can be better and this sense of self-efficacy that they, they can be the ones to make it happen, that they actually can be change agents. And so for them to really do that, they have, we have to go with ex, um, meaningful experiences. They have to use, they have to, um, we have to embed experiential learning into everything that we're doing because they need to be out in the world seeing things where they're actually making a positive difference. And the main ways we do this is we work with the D School at Stanford, so all of our students learn design thinking. And then we ask them to solve problems because the first step of design thinking is you have to empathize you have to understand people and you have to find the problems it's a lot different than project-based learning for us because project-based learning is the teacher creates something and then the students implement it but this with design thinking, is the students have to do the need finding they have to find the problems we're solving and then actually carry those out to implementation so that is something all students take for four years and then we have an intercession program, which is for two weeks, four times a year, they take a break from the regular classes. So they still have the regular classes like physics, world history, and so on. And then um, during intercession, they get classes taught by local professionals. So we have a photography class taught by a photographer. We have um, the computer coding classes, data visualization, video game design. All those um, are taught by Oracle volunteers. We have Autodesk teaching computer-aided drafting. We have professional musicians teaching rock band. We have a dancer from the Golden State Warriors that teaches our dance class. So it's all of this, um, this, this mindset that we take people outside who are able, because we have a very flexible schedule, are able to volunteer and help teach our kids these, you know, the skills. But also, going back to that meaningful experience, I mean, if we all look back on, on our education, you know, what really happened to get us where we are, we probably had one, maybe two, just really transformative experiences that really opened our eyes to you know, things that we could do with our lives. And that's what we're trying to do, do for kids. I mean, we have, you know, we've had a girls only wearable tech class where um, one of the students, uh, her grandma is visually impaired and so she always had to get her change in once. And they realized that you know, each denomination has a certain hue that's a, that's a color in it. So, they um, built this little bracelet that when you put a $5 bill under it, it plays the Mario Kart song. And so it's not something that they're going to try to like pat and sell and all this, but it's something that the student can give to her grandma and say, now when you get your change, you can put a $5 bill until it's between a five or a one. And when we talked to her after the class, she said, I just kind of thought like computers were kind of this magic thing, but now I realize they'll do whatever I tell mm -hmm. it to do. And I can kind of see myself as, as, as a software engineer. And so that's this, this transformative experience. So for us, it's really how do you design your, your whole school around providing each child a transformative experience? And we don't really know how to measure transformative experiences. We don't really have like all the metrics and everything worked out. But every time we hear the students just say, well, I used to think this, but now I think this about my future. And we know that that comes from the meaningful experiences and the social capital that they get. Mm -hmm. A lot of times skill, you know, schools can do things raising <laughs> academic skills. And then we send kids out in the world and then things get hard and they don't have the, the social capital or the network to, to fall back on. But for our students, they, they already have built their professional network because they've been taught computer coding by Oracle volunteers. So when they get to this point where they're thinking about you know, becoming an engineer, they have a, a little professional network that they can draw on also. And again, like the heart of that is the experiential lear learning because especially, you know, we talk a lot about personalization and ed tech solutions. And it's really easy for technology and personalization to turn into individualization, where if you're running a school, it's just kids at a keyboard cranking through things. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we feel it's so important to have ex these meaningful experiences just embedded into your school model, especially if you're pushing towards personalization, because that social part, as we know, that it's those social interaction, that social learning that provide us the transformative experiences. 
my turn. Um, so I'm sorry I'm late. I was on a keynote across the street, so I had to make my way back over, so I, did, I do apologize. Um, I'm Christine Cunningham. I work at the Museum of Science in Boston, running the Engineering is Elementary project. And our vision is really that every child is sort of innately a problem solver. Um, if you watch young children at play, they design forts and bridges and ski jumps and dolls beds. Um, they design and they redesign them. Um, but we've been educating that out of them and sort of telling them there's a right way to solve problems. And so we are trying to design experiences in elementary school that are relevant, accessible, um, and makes science and engineering really interesting. And to do this, we've worked very closely with schools and teachers to make sure that whatever we can do scales. So we've reached 13 million children and 150,000 teachers in classrooms as they exist today, and in under-resourced classrooms as they exist today. And the way we do it is by creating these authentic engineering experiences for children. So there's a problem that um, they are trying to solve, and they'll use a structured process to help guide them through and orient them to what the point of the activity is today. Are we brainstorming constraints and criteria, what our design solution needs to do or not do? Or is our purpose today really to do some testing and gather some data? Or is to analyze that data and try to figure out how to make things better? So while we give them a structured process, the outcomes of that and what they come up with are have sort of infinite number of original possibilities. Um, and that's really what makes it authentic for the children. They can innovate. Um, they can bring their ideas. We provide some um, of the guidance that real engineers face. You need to have your design needs to be based in science and mathematics, whatever that looks like for a six and seven year old. Um, it also needs to have decisions based in data. Um, we don't just pull something out of the sky and decide it's the best, which you know, five and six year olds really like to think their idea is the best. Um, and, by, and through this, we're trying to develop a set of what we call engineering habits of mind, really problem solving habits of mind. Um, that's the point of the project. So are the children able to identify criteria and constraints? Can they use science and math? Do they make data di different decisions? Can they work in teams? Um, but perhaps most importantly, can they see themselves as a problem solver? Because ultimately, if we can start <coughs> Um, in elementary school to build that kind of identity and affinity, um, then they can go up through these middle school and high school projects and ultimately out into the workforce wherever they may choose to work, whether it's engineering or science or teaching or law or something else, um, come up with you know, authentic, real problems and bring these skills to bear to solve them. So that's our, our ultimate goal. That is, that is awesome. Uh, so, Road Trip Nation, we skew more towards the career exploration side, and so, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the basis of, of our project really was coming out of, out of academics, academia, and uh, not really sure, you know, not really identifying with a lot of the career paths that we were exposed to, and so, you know, on a credit card funded, you know, road trip, we went out and talked to people and asked them, how did you get to where you are today? And that first road trip, have, that was 15 years ago. Um, and so that has really kind of been the premise of a media company for us, which is we've just been sending students and, and, and people actually, young people of all ages, on road trips across the United States and actually capturing these, 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 uh, these how people have defined their roads in life. It's an ethnographic approach, so to speak, to how people have found, uh, how, you know, how people have, have really essentially um, thrived in, in, in the kind of the workforce. Uh, so we have an annual series on public television that reaches over 70 million households. That's been running for over 12 years now. Uh, and that led us to building out an education company. We saw that a lot of the traffic, a lot of the views that were watching our education on um, public television were teachers. And so we thought, I, you know, we had this epiphany of like, what if Road Trip could be more about television? And, and we've, we've written a handful of books. Um, you know, what, what if it could be more about books and television? What if, what if we could have in-class course you know, curriculum, so to speak, and, and actually allow students to have some of these experiences. And so we launched a education arm 
And, uh, and so to date, we, we reach over 10 million students will have access to Road Trip Nation. 100,000 of those students will actually build out their own road trip projects in these communities. And what we've essentially seen is that a lot of the underserved, underrepresented communities that we reach now, we're a window of opportunity because for the first time, a lot of these students are seeing role models. They're seeing success. They're seeing people that have thrived. They, you know, and, and our conversations with Road Trip Nation really evolve around, you know, ambiguity like how do you deal with transitional times in someone's you know in someone's career path you know how how was that coming out of this this neighborhood or how was it coming out of college uh how was it transitioning from from the military and we did an entire road trip premise on on veterans which has really led road trip to be more intentional about the content that we collect and so we're being more intentional about the subject matter so we did a women in stem just to drive more awareness for young women to pursue science as a, as a career and so we're just being more intentional about the, the subject and, and the themes at Road Trip Nation from a media side. And we're just more excited and, and intentional about the, the leverage and the responsibility that, that we now get to share with students. And it's really about not, not so much about us having these trips. It's really about empowering young people to think about where they, what they, how they want to define their roads in life and showing them models out there that, that, have, that, that are thriving, that come from the same zip code, that come from the same ethnic background, that come from the same gender. So. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about road trip. Uh, super helpful. I, so I, I'm, I'm hearing some common themes, obviously, across okay. all of you. Um, and, uh, you, you know, building self-efficacy, agency, shifting mindsets, understandings of what you can be, problem solver. Mm -hmm. uh, th there's a whole set of things. And then I'm also hearing uh, connection to school in all of these, um, wh wh where you've come to. Uh, and some of the outcomes you're observing are actually on traditional metrics of school. And so I'm curious. Ken, you said directly, we, we can't measure all of these things that we know, sort of the proximate outcomes around, around some of these shifts in mindset. Uh, but how do you think about outcomes and how do you think about the balance between what schools have traditionally done in building, uh, let's call it academic knowledge and skills, and, uh, and having exposure to experiences and what, what, what should be a balance for, for a student or a child, maybe a better way to say it. Anyone jump in? Well, I, I think that's one of, one of the dangers of uh, experiential learning is that um, there's a chance. I, if, you go, if you go too far, you're going to miss important skills. And so it's really like you have to be able to, um, to strike that balance that the students are still getting the, the content that they need to be, to be college and career ready, but then also getting the skills. I mean, we're, I said, like, we're right now, we're very comfortable saying that we don't know exactly how to major, you know, this transformation. But we also believe that uh, this is one of those things, as I was, I get a little philosophical on this, that we, um, we know more than we have words to express. Like, I always say that um, describe the taste of water. Like, can't, don't really have the words for it, but we know, we know exactly what that is. And so we're not, we're not letting the fact that we don't have the, the metrics and the assessment systems and all that in place deter us from doing this. But I do think that, um, that you, can't, you can't let um, a school off the hook and for the skills and the content that the kids need if they just say, well, we're doing experiential learning. But then when they get, you know, when they, they go into college, there's just like important gaps in, in their, their content that they don't have. So for us, it has to be a balance. And that's why we have, that's why we have the intercession programs. We have the design thinking infused through it, but then they still have, you know, the traditional classes. And it's really the model that Stanford uses with the D school, that you can't go to Stanford and get a degree in design from the D school. You're there in the engineering department, but then you take some classes at the D school. You're in the business school, you take some classes at the D school. So you still have that content, but then you learn this design process to help you solve problems that you're still anchored in that content. Because for us, that's where, that's where innovation really occurs. It's when your problem solving skills, your problem solving curriculum matches up with your content mastery. Where those two intersect, that's where the students actually come up with real innovation. So I just say, I think um, experiential learning can get a really, um, it can get a really bad name and, um, if it is just, if it seems a little too, too loose. We've thought a lot about how are we gonna measure what it is that we do basically from the first day because if we knew if we wanted to get into um, classrooms as they exist today and we wanted to do it in a scalable way, you're going to have to have some sort of metrics that particularly the funders, whether they're external corporate funders or whether it's the school system, um, recognize. And whether you like it or not, you're going to have to do that. So we've thought about it um, 
the question on multiple tiers. The highest and sort of one we had to pitch most to school districts or what were some of these this content and um, skills that students were learning and how might we measure those? And that's a really hard task. We spent thousands of hours um, trying to develop reliable and valid um, instruments that sometimes unfortunately revert to bubble scans because when you're getting 122,000 surveys from students, you don't want to be hand entering written information. Um, and so we, from the very beginning when we started to develop the activities and the lessons, the team started with what are the outcomes, what are the objectives of what we want children to learn, and some of those may be science objectives because our engineering always connects back to the science kids are learning, so how do we apply and think about that in more deeper and more um, expansive ways as we use what we're learning about um, ecosystems to clean up an oil spill. For instance, engineer a, a solution for cleaning an oil spill. Um, some of them may be engineering learnings about you know, what does the field of engineering look like and then how do we measure that. And some of them may be a set of sort of more of these habits of mind. Those are not measurable that we've been able to discover in any kind of way through hmm. bubble scans. But you can certainly have rubrics that teachers can collect because the teachers tell us, unless I can assign a grade and I can back up how I'm doing that, it isn't coming into my classroom. And so you can have, we, we developed 16 engineering habits of mind um, that really form the basis. Um, and we asked ourselves, what would high quality engineering look like with young children? And from those, we could develop a suite of things. And teachers know them when they see them. So the teachers have a different set. Um, and you can start to convince themselves there's reasons that they do this that go far beyond my kids are learning the science better. But we also now have on the other side um, large scale random control trials that show when students do engineering with science, they learn the science better. And that allows a huge entree, particularly with the next generation science standards. So we've tried to sort of collect information at a variety of levels so we can pitch it to whomever um, we need to to lever our way into the classroom where ultimately the teacher recognizes that this sort of experience is a sea change of difference from what the kids usually have and they're asking to come in before school and bring the activities home and work on them over the summer um, and students who have literally never spoken in class for six months are starting to talk and communicate because their idea is unique and they want to tell their, their peers about it. Um, and so once you get it in there, it sort of has a life of its own, but we're always recognizing that there are these structural things that you need to be able to speak to if you're going to go to scale. J j just quickly pushing you on it. Um, mm -hmm. if, if you were czar of schools as well, um, w is that a balance that you feel is appropriate? Or would you, how would you, how would, how would you so, yeah. so how, like, because it so, sounds like there's some reinforcing right, mechanism right. in there that is maybe positive, but what's, wh wh so where I would think, you balance So I think, I mean, my, I think the challenge is that, I, I do believe that there should be some um, opportunity at, with any experience to have a reflection time where kids are generating some shared classroom knowledge about what they've come up with. So if we all went out and designed our own little um, sail that makes our boat go down a track, what are we learning from all these different designs about what makes a good sail? It needs to be stiff enough to catch the wind, but if you make it too big, eventually the boat tips over because it becomes hot, top heavy. So there are things that we can generate. And if you don't have that sort of reflective component, I think ultimately it just becomes kids tinkering and you know, nobody really pushes learning to where it, it should go. So I do think there are some um, very important discussions that we try to work carefully with teachers um, that pull out what's important. Where I think it gets really challenging is if we're trying to create different kinds of experiences for students, then turning around and saying, we need to measure this with a bubble scan test is really difficult. Like, we have not been able to even design much in the way of engineering that captured that accurately. And we know it's happening, we just can't design experiences, because at some point when you're seven, you can problem solve. The kids who have been exposed to certain kinds of environments and come from certain environments that promote that kind of thinking, do all on a test whether or not you've done anything in school because they come from environments like this. So all you're measuring is sort of their background experiences in a mm. sense. Um, so I actually wish we would get rid of some of that, a lot of that, especially in elementary school, and go away from the, we need to test and test and test kids with bubble scans. Hopefully, you know, someday in the future that will go away and we'll give a lot more autonomy to teachers about being to, able to make that kind of 
um, decision because they ultimately know students and they know where the kid came in and they know how the child has moved and that may or may not be captured by any sort of thing on paper, um, but we're not there yet. So the vision for the future is we can pull back from some of this intense paper and pencil testing, but. So the testing, maybe, but, but yeah. the content knowledge, it sounds the like content, is, is, is I just actually don't, quite a, The kids should be learning, they need to be learning something, and I think thinking very carefully about what are the learning objectives is. There can be a, a variety of them. It could be that we want kids to be able to have a conversation with one other child. So when you're six and seven, like entertaining that your partner might have a different idea about what your design looks like, and the two of you need to come together and negotiate a shared design, like that could be a huge learning objective that has nothing to do with specific, you know, and we are going to learn today that, you know, cumulus clouds tend to come before we have rain. I mean, those are, one's factoid and one's process based. But I think if we don't articulate what we want the kids to get out of it, then it's a bunch of messing around. Um, and the kids don't get it, and I don't think we're doing service to them. Well, I, I get a little nervous with rubrics though, just because I like, I and mean, we feel like rubrics can stifle innovation for the kids. Like we always say, like, where was you know a Tesla on the rubric? Like where was it? there wasn't like a root for that, but the, there's something outside of that. And the thing that I worry about is that just I just maybe this is still like too much standards-based reform, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Is that <laughs> like if we end up like this turns out like now there's this big movement towards you know these other skills, problem-solving skills. And then we end up five years from now, well, here is your 10-page scripted curriculum on teaching creativity or teaching problem solving. And here's the 16-page, you know, the 16-point rubric mm -hmm. for checking all these things off. And then we get right back to where we were or where we were with the standards. And so I've, I don't know, we've, we have, have we've just really resisted putting the rubrics on the experiential learning. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think there are so many ways actually to do this. And, to speak to the audience, and I know you're all probably from some different situations, I think there are so many ways that we can think about experiential learning. So in Embark, we think about uh, it as a class the students take every day, and they're doing, they're doing all this stuff to prepare for journeys. They're also doing all this social emotional stuff uh, in the curriculum. But, um, but the experiences that they're going on, uh, many of those experiences are not actually graded in the same sort of way. But what we see is that the outcomes in their everyday classrooms and schools and in their, uh, their issues in, in the rest of classes, the behavioral issues, all of those are, the behavioral issues are declining, their outcomes in classes are increasing, uh, their uh, outcomes out of school are increasing. So you can see that if you start doing certain experiences in this way, you may not have to measure every single element of what you're doing in the application, but you're going to see the outcomes happening uh, all over. You're going to see these outcomes happening all over the rest of their, their schooling. So you can look at it that way. You can also look at things where um, you, know, you could do really intensive experiences in which uh, it, it becomes experiential learning that's project-based. So you take the project, and then you basically actualize it in the real world, other corporate partners or in uh, all these places, and then you're able to sort of test every element of that like you would test a project-based learning sort of, sort of thing. Um, of course, you've got you to keep in mind there's also uh, mindset shifting things uh, or process things, as you were mentioning, that you want to sort of see. You can benchmark that as it grows a little bit as well. But in the, in the world of data, that's soft, right? That's, uh, that's, that's uh, qualitative stuff. Uh, and people really, in, in many ways, want to see the quantitative stuff. And uh, that's how we've been able to get into schools, was basically show that, this inter that doing these experiences will dramatically increase outcomes everywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and, a lot, and then we give students a grade on the class just like they would any other course. Um, and it's just their, their, their work is being graded. So you can do it in a bunch of different ways. Uh, as you're going to sort of think about experiences, you're going to think about measuring them, and you're going to think about their outcomes. But in the end, we want to we, we want ask ourselves exactly what do we want for our students. We want them to uh, be more successful in academics and in their life. And so if you can sort of pull some of those metrics and sort of measure the work they're doing and experiences against those, I think you, you get a lot, you get really far. I think we have this temptation to you know, do randomized control trials on experience-based learning and see how that, that's all going to sort of play out. But I think there is so much to think about in uh, how do you measure expanding one's minds and all those kind of things. But I think that 
if we get caught up in that, we don't recognize that it's dramatically moving all the other metrics that, 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 are, the, that are the ones that we're looking at. Are their academic outcomes increasing? Are their behavioral infractions decreasing? Are they going to college? Are they going to work? Are they increasing their happiness? And those are the elements that I think, if we stay true to those as, as the guiding star, we don't play some of these other games that may get so distracting. I, uh, there's two, there's two uh, kind of topics that actually drove us deep into the education space. Uh, it, was, it was the Gates report on the silent, the silent epidemic. And I think there's two kind of fundamental outcomes from that on their survey that really got Road Trip Nation really uh, just, just uh, engaged with, with two areas of the classroom. I mean, so what we do at Road Trip Nation is we, we, we try to, uh, to measure uh, around two topics of, you know, do, you, do your classes feel more relevant? Are you more engaged in the classroom? And do you feel like you have more real world, real world learning opportunities? Uh, these were the two fundamental breakdowns that the silent epidemic report founded, uh, that students were dropping out because they didn't feel that they were really connected to the real world. They didn't feel like they had enough real world <laughs> learning opportunities. And so, you know, 14 years later, eight years later with the education space with Road Trip, uh, we do, you know, on a technical side, we do pre and post surveys. Um, and, and we don't have this in, internally. It's actually an area that we're building out capacity within Road Trip to do more social data, social scientist evaluations, but we've always kind of outsourced it to a third party. And Dr. David Conley came to us through EPIC, the Education Policy Improvement Center, um, and they came to us saying, look, you guys are really strong around this non-cognitive quadrant. Like, you guys are really putting a finger on some of these areas of self-efficacy. So I think there's two things that we study or that we try to measure is, uh, is exposure, uh, you know, exposure to possible pathways. Do students feel like they know uh, all the different kind of areas that they can actually pursue? Um, and then... Uh, uh, so that, that's, that's, that's primarily one, and then it's relationships, and, and trying to formalize relationships and a sense of identity and belongingness. Um, it, it's pretty broad. Uh, we did not get into this from a data side. We're actually peeling back the layers of data right now uh, to see some of this, but as the research came back to us, as we approached those two kind of areas, uh, GPA scores came to us, and GPA scores over an academic year increased at t twice the rate. We did a comparison study in San Jose. We weren't expecting that. We weren't thinking that that was going to be the outcome, uh, and it surprised all of us, including the, the folks at Epic. And it's significant because it's not a test score where you're memorizing and all of a sudden you just felt good one day and you're like, wow, I just nailed that. Uh, what they brought to us, because we're not social scientists, we're not researchers, we, we're not, we did not you know, write uh, white papers on this. But what they said was interesting is that this is actually a sign that there's, there's more drive, that there's more effort putting, there's more grit, there's more determination that these students were, were sharing over a course of a year. So uh, we're, we're trying to sharpen our skills on this and now with Strata and, and the work that Gallup is producing around the consumer index report that will be launched in June. But as we map ourselves to employability and, and thriving, you know, productivity and thriving you know, how do you thrive in the workplace? Uh, there's a lot of research that's actually allowing this conversation to be uh, level set. And, you know, it's hard to put a finger on career readiness. And it was kind of like always on the, on the coattails of, if you're college ready, you're going to be career ready. And we'll just kind of worry about that later. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome, especially at this summit, that so much of the conversation is around yeah. career and so much around experiential. That mm. is a soft skill. You can talk about social and emotional and psych, but let's put a finger on that. And it's pretty neat to see that the conversation's being, it, it's, 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 it's starting to level the playing field. And I think there's one outcome that Road Trip has seen over the years is that there's this perspective that a lot of people have that there's one way to do things and there's the right way to do things. And what we have learned after interviewing thousands of people is that there's no right way. And it's a series of steps. And you've got to get through those series of steps. And usually that's around you know, uh, your, your critical thinking or your social skills. Your, I mean, I remember sitting down with Howard Schultz on our first road trip and we talked about the resume and he said, this experience is going to bring context. It's going to bring texture mm. to your guys' lives. It's not just a resume. I want to see between the lines. I want to see what types of experiences and, and, and extracurricular activity. And coming from CEO of, of, of Starbucks, it's a little affirming that we're on the right path, even though we had no clue at that time what we were really doing other than having these conversations about how people get to where they are in life. And the first thing they don't drop to us was GPA. 
which was reassuring for me at least. No, that's really, I, I, I always like to say that uh, there's always these disputes, quantitative versus qualitative data, and everyone forgets that data is human made, not, not naturally existing. But uh, uh, so last question with our, with our final five minutes. I'm curious, as you look at, if we could call it a movement of, of building experiential learning for students and making sure that every student has these meaningful uh, opportunities, uh, what, what does the movement most need now? Where, where are we in this and, and what's most critical? I, I go ahead and start with that. I mean, I feel the thing that's, um, it is, it's very critical right now. And like I was saying earlier about, we hear a lot of talk about personalization and these technology solutions, which um, really ends up in this individualized role for the student. And so we just think, I think right now it's really important to balance that out with this conversation about meaningful experiences. But I think what we really need are the um, people like this on the panel that are doing really quality work because we don't want to um, come back to this 10 years from now and just say, oh, that was just, you know, that was a fad, it didn't really work. And I feel especially that there'll be a lot of eyes on the, the people that are doing this work. And so I think the main thing, like for us, like we're not focused on going to scale or anything like that. We are just trying to be really, really good at this so people can look at this and just say like, Okay, like that works, like experiential learning works and then they can take those ideas and, and figure out in their own context. So I think the most critical thing is just high quality, it's an ecosystem of high quality practitioners that um, are showing that this is, the, this, this is lasting um, and it has the most important impact on kids that we can have and that we're just um, doing a really good job with it. You know, I think, um if you ask me what's one of the greatest challenges that we're facing as a country, I would say that um, you know, it's isolation at the core. Right? It's probably the basis of racism, of hate, of inequity, of uh, unfair laws. Uh, and I think that so much of being able to address isolation can be done through our, our schools um, because there are such permanent elements in our communities uh, and there's such a huge opportunity there to think about experiential learning uh, not just as something that's happening for the students that's dramatically going to change outcomes for them in their life, but also to think about it as the amount of people that those students are then going to have the opportunity to interact with in the real world and how that shifts and changes our social fabric, uh, how that changes each individual who gets an opportunity to sit across the table from someone who they don't know, have never met, uh, and get to share life stories and have these uh, interactions. What we've seen is that uh, so many of the people that are interacting with our students say that they think they've gotten more out of it than our students have. Mm -hmm. uh, and sort of thinking about what does the movement need, I think it's what does our world need. And I think our world also needs to address our issues of how are we interacting with humans on a human-to-human -human basis. And um, there was a study done in 1985. Uh, it was recently in the Sociological Review. And it said that uh, in 1985, one in f 10 people said that they were isolated from other humans. Um, in 2014, it turned into one in four. Um, that is a dramatic shift, especially when you look at how our technological advancements to make us more connected are emerging. So, you know, if you ask me what do, what do we need, I, I, I would say that we need bold and we need adoption. We need teachers, we need schools, we need people to start pushing to be able to get their students out of their classroom to realize that, hell, maybe 20% of the time that they go to school, it should not be in the building. It should be interacting with all sorts of people. We need to be able to figure out a way that lots of people can start doing this. I, I feel a little differently um, about the idea of making sure that you need something perfect and something really well done before people can start using it. I believe that our teachers and our society and our country especially needs our educators to start pushing the boundary feel, getting access to, to ways that they could do it, even light, even on, even in different ways, because I'm also very confident, uh, we've seen this happen many times in Chicago, that when educators start doing one or two of these journeys, they and their students are immediately hooked. Like, you will see the results. There is no question about it. And you'll feel it, you'll know it, 
And that, uh, if you start repeating that kind of thing, you start doing so many things for the students, but also for, for our country. So um, I think our <coughs> movement needs uh, bold moves and needs people to start doing stuff. Christine, 30 um, seconds. <laughs> I would say one thing I would really encourage is as we develop the experiences, we make sure they work for all students and particularly those who have tended to be underserved or underrepresented. Mm -hmm. So that really mm -hmm. requires um, digging very deeply, making sure that you have a wide range of possibilities and that um, you know the kinds of things that either attract or drive people out of what you're doing. Right. I would, I would say uh, the increasing social capital. Um, as Road Trip Nation, you know, our mission is to empower people to find the roads in life, and it's been, a, it's been an honor to now be folded into a broader mission, uh, completion with purpose. And success is defined differently across the board. And from a career perspective, I think that social capital is critical, exposure is critical, and just the opportunities to engage and create more real world learning opportunities is, is what, I, what I feel would be awesome. Thank you guys so much.